Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org consequence and the consequence podcast network thanks as always for making your way here checking out the series please do hit that subscribe button you know how this works i do three new interviews every single week new one every monday wednesday and friday so it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists and i'm so excited she's back kate siegel hello what's up music people and also <laughs> listeners who are not into music <laughs> just everyone that's everyone right super inclusive super inclusive <laughs> It's so great to see you. Um, there was uh, you did some work over the uh, over the past year, and I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that because now that we can, uh, the fall of the House of Usher, it's now on Netflix, and it was it was a little bit tough watching this. Going, I can't wait to talk about this show, <laughs> but we can't do that yet. So. You can only imagine what the group chat was like. Just just curse words as far as the eye could see, because there's so much to be said about it. And we were, this group of people got along so well. All we wanted to do was go on a press tour together and be chaotic in interviews. And unfortunately, the AMPTP wouldn't pay us the money that the actors served. So we had to go on strike. Yeah. So so how did you keep yourself busy for, what was it, 188 days, something like that? I started making really ridiculous Instagram reels and TikTok videos. <laughs> I downloaded CapCut and then I was like, I felt as if I was the first person to ever discover CapCut. And I was like, this is so fun. And I would just make random videos. And so yeah. I really increased my follower count, hopefully. You kept us entertained, which was sort <laughs> of like, like you found, like everybody sort of found a way, well, whoever wanted yeah. to, I guess, found a way, right? But like, yeah. I, I don't know if that's just an itch that you you have to, like, what, what was yeah. that, that did you just need to still be? Oh, yeah. I, um if I'm not doing something like that, if I'm not receiving a constant stream of attention from the general public, <laughs> I'll just go into stasis like a sad hibernating bear. No, I think it's just, um, there's a certain itch that gets scratched by self tapes. It's not the best way to scratch an itch. It's like masturbation as opposed to sex. And um, it was gone. And so I had to do something. And I just, this is fun. It's yeah. Now does everything? Do you get to put that back on the back burner now, or, or are you? Well, gonna... now I really like it, <laughs> so I think I'll keep it up. I I just like these things that come into my head, and like I make mocktails and I'll make videos. I don't know if it'll be as constant, but yeah. I think I fell in love again. Yeah, it was fun to watch. It was fun to watch, but I, I can't. You know, I don't mind saying selfishly that I'm also happy that you're back to work and oh, uh, everyone wonderful. is back to work, mm -hmm. and um, and we do. I you know, so let's let's talk let's talk about the show because I feel like we waited so long for this one. And I know that there's a lot of story about why that happened. And maybe we'll get into that as well. Mm -hmm. But just to get into the, so for the folks, I guess, who haven't seen it, The Fall of the House Usher is not just about the one Edgar Allan Poe short story, but it's a love letter to many of his stories. And it's so much more. I mean, um, and I, I might have seen this elsewhere, but, you know, I did write down those words, expanding a story of privilege, wealth, and greed. Yes. And what it means absolutely. today. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind just me throwing the big question at you, what does this show mean to you? What what was it exactly beyond the obvious? Yeah, I think The Fall of the House of Usher is about the necessity of pain. Why we need pain in our lives, why we need struggle, why like pain emotionally and all that stuff, because litigone, which is the drug it's all based on, its whole thing was I'm going to eradicate pain. Like Roderick was like, I'm and Madeline were like, we're going to have a pain free world. And without pain and suffering, there is no compassion, empathy, or joy. You have a very neutral, bland, splenda existence of life, which you see through all of these Usher kids, especially the bastards who came in after the deal was made. And so for me, it was always about pain, the necessity of it, the forms of it, and how we process it. It's sort of like um, people talk about you need death to appreciate life. Mm -hmm. Although I'm I'm more on the side of the vampires. If I had the chance, I think I would take it. Honey, no, I'm not going to let you get away with that. Go down that path. Go down that path. You live forever. Mm -hmm. Nothing is lost to you. There is no sense of urgency. How quickly do you just spend 12 to 15 hours a day watching YouTube videos? <laughs> I would like, if vampires are real, you think that's a thing? Like, I just... 
<laughs> the ones that are addicted to YouTube and TikTok. Man, that's that's the thing. Like, if you told me I lived forever, I, I, there's nothing. There's no rush for me to do anything. Yeah, I don't know. I just sit around all day and do shit. Like, I'm not gonna build the pyramids. I I'm not doing like the only thing that gets me going is a deadline. We talk. My wife and I talk about this because uh, she'll watch some of the uh, the vampire shows. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the the ones that it's always, of course the guys who have been around for a few hundred years and they hang around with high school students. And I think, why would you give a, why would you give a damn about any of this? Well, any, any of this, you know, it's. Yeah, that's very funny. It's true. It's true. I choose not to hang out with high school students now and I'm not immortal. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, I do love the idea of, of, of the pain because uh, obviously pain's a big part of it. Uh, that one, I don't think that those, that the way of structuring it that way was really obvious to me, but but just seeing the way that everyone gets so tormented. I mean, from the beginning, we know that this isn't a happy ending. Yeah. Nor is it usually ever with, <laughs> with Mike Probably not. No, no. Oh, Mike Flanagan oh. is not giving you just yeah. everybody gets tickets to the Yankee game. <laughs> Does that change how you start in something like this? Like how you go into your character, like how anybody goes into a story like this, knowing that it's it's only going to end badly. Well, this one was really fun because I was um, working on Time Traveler's Wife. I was working on something else. I can't remember when the who followed the House of Usher writer's room came up. And I was in my office doing stuff and Mike came in and he was like, hey, how do you feel about having your face ripped off by a monkey? Spoilers. Um, and I was like, what? And I was like, you're so funny. Because I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the room morgue. I was like high school level education po. and he was like, the murders in the room morgue is this very famous story. And it turns out the murderer was a chimpanzee. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And so the thing that I did say, because I'm human, was I was like, then I have to be hot as fuck. If I die with my face being ripped off, then I want to be the hottest bitch around. And so th in that way, yes, the performance of it, you know, Camille figures it out like a half second before it happens to her. But Otherwise, I just create a character normally. But to me, that counterpose of knowing how the ghost was going to look, I just wanted to be so pretty. And it was such a really cool look. I mean, you had the silver hair. Yeah. What you talk, you might have talked about it on some of the the Netflix promo that was done before the strike about how you found this character and uh, what what what's what's the word? Because it's um, it's Mirage it's, from The Incredibles. Thank you. That's what I was. Which, by the way, I was an adult when I saw Jesus Christ getting dragged on Twitter as my least favorite thing. I would like to say that it's, it, it. I already said it. It's awkward. I just said something, and you can't go back. And you're trying to make the interviewer laugh, and it's just like, ugh, got people. <laughs> now, when, when you say you base some of it, was that the look? I mean, I don't. It was just like, the look. Just the look, right? Because happened... I can't imagine the characters from that. No, 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 no. Although there is something cartoonish about Camille because Camille is splashy. She's only there for three episodes. She's only there to create the pattern, right? Once uh, you know, you don't really know what's going on. Perry's melted, Maury's melted. And when it happens to Camille, that's when you go, oh, and when everybody else goes, oh, it looks like something's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity because she doesn't have to carry a lot of exposition or a lot of like emotional like centering the way Aaron Green did. Aaron Green's entire job was to be still in the center of the storm. And I had to do that and I couldn't make big moves and I couldn't make big choices. And it was to stand there at the intersection of Hamish and Sam and the sheriff and Zach and just stand still. Camille's the opposite. Camille got to be crazy. And so there's something cartoonish about her in, in the way she chooses to present herself, the way she dresses, the way she interacts with her assistants. But no, the look of Mirage, we knew it wanted to be blonde. And when Ashley came in with some different blondes, it wasn't quite working. I, it wasn't quite it. And then she had this blue Amazon wig and she just dropped it on my head. So the wig is actually blue. Okay. Yeah. That, that must be like, uh, what was the old thing? The, uh, the the dress color that we all debated a few years ago. Oh yes, black no, and gold. Right. No, but it's blue because Camille's whole uh, vibe is silver. 
and all of that cool lighting, any yellow hair mm -hmm. would have not read on screen. So it needed to be a certain tone for camera. I guess it's like she was a person. She's not. But if she was, her hair would be silver. But the wig itself was blue. I just thought that's fun. That's just what my memory, they just, it just flipped it right then. That's, yeah. what, that's what just happened right there. When you and I last talked and, and, and we were, all we, all you could do is kind of give me little hints about this show. You mentioned Doja Cat. Yes. Uh, don't bite. Yeah. As, as mm -hmm. this character. And you're like, just wait. Just wait. Yeah. Now, are you able to expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So this vibe, like the vibe of that kind of like a little bit like icy, vipery, sexy, like I'm a thing, but I'm not a thing. I like do a thing, but I don't do a thing. That was very much um, right at the base for me. Like that's the type of song I would listen to driving to set every day. These kind of like pay playful, violent women. Yeah. Had you all ever done anything like, I guess I'd say this sexual and sometimes hedonistic, it sounds yeah. like, but. Uh... <laughs> well, you can be judgy. The ushers are bad people. Like they're, every single one of them is a bad person. They're not mm -hmm. a good person. Well, I guess Lenore is a good person, but the rest of them are bad people. They're hedonistic. They are self-indulgent. They are self-obsessed. They are narcissistic. They're sociopathic. Like they're bad people. So no, we haven't done a show about bad people before. Yeah. Like that had to be fun. Oh, uh Oh my God. So there's this thing when you sign a contract for a long running series, they make you sign it for seven years, or at least they used to before a new contract. Camille's the only one I would have done for seven years. <laughs> That's interesting. That's really interesting. Any reason why? She's so much fun. She's yeah. a blast. Yeah. yeah. Just to it's so in. much fun to play a bad person. Yeah. Now you, you already mentioned it, you know, so she does, she, she, dip, she dips out early, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know, like, you, you you have more scenes after that, of course. I'm a ghost, yeah. Yeah, because there's the ghost stuff. I guess what I'm getting to, and maybe this is one of those questions, but like, how do you and Mike decide who you're going to play? I mean, how much do, do you come? It's like, oh, but she's gone early. I want to do someone late. Does that ever happen like that? No, um, I trust Mike completely. And this sounds like lip service, but it's not. He tells me where he needs me and I go there. And if And it's because the we try to keep the boundary very clean. So work, he's my boss. He's my boss. And that happens from call time to rap. It happens during prep and things like that. At home, I'll like make nonsense stuff. Like he'll be writing a scene. I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if Camille wasn't dead at all? And instead she was just there and she was getting a massage. Like things like that. Like those are just like, like goofy marriage stuff. But no, he tells me where to go, what to stand, what to say. Yeah, where to stand, not what yeah. to stand. Stand up is what you would say. Uh, the characters have been iconic so far, so whatever formula you guys got going on seems to work. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So I don't know how much you want to say about this, but would it be accurate also to say that shit went down? Dude, the most shit went down. People who are correctly praising Bruce need to remember that every single scene Bruce shot that wasn't sitting down across from Carl Lumley was an emergency reshoot. We redid almost all of his stuff. It's amazing what he did. Yeah. And, and seeing him, like you hear about, I don't know, those old, you know, stories like uh, Tom Selleck auditioned for Indiana Jones. You're like, oh man, I love Tom Selleck, but thank God that didn't happen, you know, yeah, like, support yeah. or whatever. This is one of those moments where I'm like, knowing, you know, what, you know, everybody that was before this and, and, and with Bruce and everything, it's like, oh man, Oh man, I think this is way probably way like and and I I wasn't there I don't know, but um but he is he's fantastic in in, in this and and watching him work and everything but but you know what is it to be part of something like that and then just have it stop and not exactly fall apart but I guess that yeah. was always it was awesome. heartbreaking it was it was overwhelming and heartbreaking and disappointing and and you know people were hurt I I was tangentially I wasn't involved in any of the um actual HR stuff, but hearing about it, knowing that cast members felt sad and uncomfortable uh, and taken advantage of by an, other members of the cast, other member of the cast. And it was just devastating because Mike has spent so much time building an amazing set life and experience and family. And to know that one person can come in and just fuck that shit up made me furious as well. And I think when Bruce came, there was palpable relief from everybody because we had a scene partner and we had somebody we respected who respected us and a family member back. 
And I think it just, for me, solidified that feeling of you don't need to be tortured to be an artist. You can be a good person and show up and do your job, even if you're playing somebody extreme, even if you are um, in extreme situations, you are capable. Anybody is capable of being sane, pleasant, and professional on set. Yeah. And still bring out great yeah. art on top yeah. of that. Which, yes. same can be said, bringing into the family, Mark Hamill is here now. Talk about playing despicable characters, but... Let me say this again. Mark Hamill is in this. That Mark that... Hamill. <laughs> Honestly, like everybody, like Mark Hamill is a perfect example of you should meet your heroes. He's exactly as kind, respectful, charming, funny, everything you want him to be. Just mm, chef's kiss, Mark Hamill. Yeah. Uh, how did, is there a story? How did that happen? I mean, who came up with the idea to cast him? Oh, God. How did that happen? I have literally no idea. Yeah. I don't. I'm sure I knew then and I don't know now. I'm so sorry. No, he arrived and he's there and that's the important. He thing. showed up. He he astral projected himself there and then his body showed up and boom, pulled out a lightsaber and he's <laughs> ours. But, you know, and I could go down. I mean, and, and seeing Carla in all of her different personalities. I mean, again, there's just so much to be said about. Yes. You know, everything that happens in this. Um, and a dream to introduce Mary McDonald to this world. Like, what an actress. Like, immediately fit in. Immediately is just riveting and so much fun to have on set. Like, we all had, like, there were adults in the room. And so, like, poor me, Rahul you know, Tania and Sam and Sorian, we're all just acting the fool and the adults like wouldn't even sit in our green room. They had nothing to do with us. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was thinking back last time we talked to because uh, we also talked about one of your iconic moments and at, at that point in Midnight Mass and the scream in the boat. And now to see your exit scene, and I will throw the spoiler at the beginning of this because yeah. we've already talked about some of it anyway, but with the ape at the end, it's it's a very different type of exit, especially your last words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thought like, got mine. like it, it, I guess in the way I'm, I, you know, I would ask about, you know, how you that that scream in that boat and everything. Like, how did you how did you go into that day? How did you go into that scene? So that scene we shot in the middle of the night, and there was nothing there. It was just me and Carla. All of the animals were added after the fact digitally. And we had Terry, who was our movement coach, who performed some of the chimps in uh, Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. He was there teaching Carla her movement. And so he would get in the cage to kind of give me a sense of what was going to happen on the day. And I, I spoke very deeply with Michael Fiminari, who is my director for that episode, who I love with all of my heart. I've been working with for years. And we had talked a lot about Camille's bullshit detector about Camille knowing that this world was full of, of shit and smoke and mirrors and her desperate need to know why she hated Vic so much. Like this was just a question for her. Like, why do I hate my sister? And the, the moment of relief and understanding from Carla was almost a gift, right? That this is inevitable and this is going to be terrible. And how do you want to face death? And I just, it's one of the reasons I love Camille so much because she didn't beg, she didn't, she didn't flinch, but she got what she needed. And she was like, this is going to suck. Let's do it. And I, there's something so profound about that. And I, it was when, once I had that knowledge and love of the character's choice, I was able to drop in pretty quickly with the performance happening above me was deeply terrifying. Carla was at a hundred at every take, even off camera. And I'm grateful for her for that because it was just, there's no way to, once Camille realizes what's happening and she believes in crazy stuff. Like we have a whole, Camille has a whole backstory that I made up because I had a, like months and months to sit and do nothing but journal. And when she figures out this is how it's going to go, it's how it's going to go. Yeah. The backstory, and like, I don't know how much stuff ends up, as they say, on the cutting room floor you know, with, yeah. with a series like this, because there's so many stories. And and one thing I always love about my storytelling is I always feel like every scene counts. Like there's never, it never feels like there's much filler at all. And when, you know, when you have someone like that, when you have a story like this, I mean, are there, are there big pieces that you have to leave behind or is everything really constructed mm -hmm. in there? 
No, it's it's constructed. It's in the scripts. It's very few. Like there are some little pieces of scenes that have sure. been cut, but most of it stays. The backstory was more for me because, like we said, like Camille's a splash. Like she's short and spicy. I wanted to know in my head what the grounding force was. Like there's this whole sobriety storyline with Camille that isn't scripted. That I just knew that Camille was sober up until the point she takes that edible at Leo's house. And that's when she relapses. And then that changes her choices until the end of her life. And so that was just important for me in terms of creating a short and exciting arc. Like I needed something that turned everything. And of course, everything's turning around her as well. But there needed, I think, to be internal motivation for what happens at Leo's apartment, what then happens with my assistants, what then takes me to the room morgue, what then takes me past that security guard into the cages and not leaving that room, why? And for me, it was because I needed something that tangible that I could react to was the breakdown of her sobriety. And so in the beginning, I say beginning, but like in episodes one and two, you will see Camille like pour a drink and put it away from her or like she won't touch the wine at dinner. But it's all that kind of stuff that as an actor, Gives you something to hold on to when crazy stuff is going on around you. I cannot wait now to go back and see that because I love that. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I'll also, uh, you know, just mention here because um, uh, the show opens up with uh, another brick in the wall with Pink. Yes. Pink. And I thought, how did they just not blow their budget <laughs> right away? <laughs> so, I mean, not to mention like all the the joy of Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross that came in. Like they have become friends and family and they're just like oh the music the music in usher just, mm. and of course the newton brothers that we always have yeah yeah trent and atticus i uh, i own several of their scores and every single time i mean first off it's trent reznor you know and it's right it's very jealous of that yet to have him on the series trent if you're watching i know you always are always <laughs> watching with bated <laughs> breath no I mean like genius level genius like touched by god genius and like I also believe Mike is a touched by god genius and when they meet it's like they, they, they have a whole thing and I'm just like hi <laughs> to be that fly right that's yeah. what you get to be to be that fly yeah um are you allowed to say what's next is it do you know what's next yeah I have a couple of things well we just wrapped life of Chuck mm -hmm. which is that Stephen King short story where it's um it was an interim agreement project and it's finished now. And so that is now in post-production. It's fantastic. It is not horror. Mm -hmm. And so it's the first time that we've done a classic Spielberg-esque life-affirming story. Wow. Cannot mm -hmm. wait, as usual. Um, yeah. You never let us down. So I expect that you'll be batting a thousand. <laughs> so it's inevitable. Hopefully <laughs> this <laughs> Kate, it's so great to speak to you again and see you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do it. Yeah, thanks for a wonderful interview. Talk to you at the next one, I hope. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.